Three indicators, ladies and gentlemen. Three indicators is all I've ever used throughout my entire trading career of eight plus years now and nearly $5 million in trade for profits, right? Not five, not 10, not 20, three indicators. I like to keep it simple. I like to keep it straightforward and not overcomplicate things. And if you want to know what those three indicators are, you've come to the right place. Hi, my name is Kyle Williams, part of Clover Trading here. And like I just mentioned, I've only ever used three indicators. They're going to be kind of counterintuitive. You're not going to expect me to say these three indicators, but they're the truth, right? I'm not going to try to give you some holy grail, something special that no other trader knows about or uses. Um, it's very simple, solid things in the market that people know or the great traders know how to use well. And I think that's the key is how do we use these indicators, right? So without further ado, let's jump right in. Indicator number one, you're going to be like, oh my gosh, Kyle, this guy sucks. What? This is your first indicator is price, right? Duh. And the reason why I say that is because you can look at RSI, you can look at MACD, you can look at all these different fancy indicators, moving averages, whatever it is. But the reality is all of them come from and deviate from price and volume. That's it. The chicken does come before the egg in this scenario, right? Price and volume comes first and every other indicator comes after. And so why not move, remove and forget all of the fancy indicators that people like and know and go to the source, go to where the indicators are coming from, which are price and volume, which is again, number one, we're going to go over price. Now, what do I mean by price? Like, not just the price of the stock, but the price action of the stock, right? Where and how is the stock moving and what is it telling us, right? Stop trying to guess and play games and let the stock tell you where it wants to go. You just have to listen. And so what I mean by that, let's look at a, a most recent runner that we've had in small cap land, SOUN here. There are many indicators here that if you just looked at them, they would tell a story, right? Before maybe they knew the happen. Obviously, you know, we're talking in hindsight here, but there's certain indicators in price that you can see happen before they actually happen, right? That's what gives us the odds to take trades and feel confident about taking a trade. And so the first thing here is that this has multiple higher highs. Some of you are a fan of like making wedges or flag patterns. That is price action, right? That is a form of losing price as an indicator. And for these, you know, five or six days leading up to this breakout, it kept supporting itself, you know, every day at a higher high every day, you know, besides this day going lower, it was still higher than the previous two days. And it kind of creates this upwards trend that no one really wants to really notice. And some of you may did not only just the higher highs, but the wicks clearly someone is buying this up every single day. It is never closes at its lows at all. If anything, it's close relative closer to its highs than its lows. And all you need is one day of more bigger volume, which we'll talk about in the next you know, section of this video that caused the breakout. Vice versa. Now that we're on a downtrend, it's the opposite. A huge wick did close near its highs, but again, a lower low or a, sorry, a lower high from the all-time high of, you know, nearly eight bucks. And we're in that trend. Every day now is a lower low. Finally, now we're starting an uptrend, starting a bounce day. And again, higher highs or, or higher lows on the other end. But that's a very simplistic way to look at things. And it's like, obviously, that doesn't necessarily lead to profitable trades. But just I can't tell you how many people step in the way of trends simply because they don't want to look at what the price section is telling them. Now, did I long this breakout? No, I didn't think SOAN was going to be that strong, but I certainly didn't short it. <laughs> because I did know these wicks. I did notice that it was holding very well and it at least prevents me from taking and losing trades. Winning trades in the hand, we'll actually have to go to the intraday here. Now, part of price action is not just higher highs, lower highs, you know, higher lows, lower lows, whatever, right? That's the very basic stuff. But beyond that, it is then using the red green level, right? Is the price action green on the day or red on the day? That is a huge, huge shift between whether someone, a buyers are aggressive or shorts are aggressive, right? For, but vice versa, if a stock is green, it's more likely to stay green. If a stock's red, it's more likely to stay red kind of idea. And so when using those indicators or, or taking note of that is massive. And I'll tell you why, because I made this exact same mistake on SUN just a couple weeks ago. You know, the red green level was around, I think, actually it was probably the same level over this white line. It was in the high fives, okay? And we had gapped up huge, right? We were opening up at seven bucks, um, a full dollar share plus off the highs. And so it has, a, you know, has some morning dips, has some morning spikes, right? If we zoom in here, chops around really most of the day. Now, granted, I did make money this day because I just, I got a good entry up in the high I7 shorting it, but nonetheless, it never died off like I wanted because it was green on the day. And I partially should have known this. However, when I was short, I did not expect it to go red because it was so green. It was so off the lows in terms of how much it would take for it to go red that I knew buyers were going to be in control most of the day. Now, granted, were they better, were they more in control better than I thought? Oh, totally. But because I had such a good entry up here, I didn't actually end the day or on this ticker red. However, I kind of expected that. This wasn't trying to be a home run win. I knew it was not going to go red as a short seller. I try to wait the best trades to go red. And you'll notice the next day, right out the open, right? Because again, the previous day's closed now. At this point, it closed right at like nine or six eighty, six ninety, right up in here. And the opening minute candle, if we zoom in, right, right here, the opening minute is six seventy four. 
Okay, so it gapped down about 10 to 20 cents. And what do you know? The previous day being a huge gap up, being able to chop up and down all day long, never even getting close to the red green or going red on the day. Versus the next day, I have it gapping down because it's now 10 cents below the previous day's close. And right out the open is the panic. And did I short? Absolutely. I was already short before the open because it was already gapping down. And it panicked right away. I remember covering some in the in the 620s and then covered some more at six. And then I think I got the rest out in like the 590s here. I actually timed this bottom pretty well, which we'll go talk about in the next indicator. But nonetheless, it was much simpler learn easy and straightforward of a panic of a short sell for me because I waited for the stock to be red. I can't tell you how many times I have thought a stock short because it's green. And if I just waited for the first time it was red, it's such a more easier walk in the park of a trade. Vice versa, I can't tell you how many times I've tried to buy a stock red of the day thinking I should get some huge move to the upside. And if I just waited for it to be green or be above a resistance level or be below a support level, it makes a world of a difference. Now, red green is more of like a psychological green or red on the day kind of level, but there's also support. There's also resistance, right? All these variables that I'm bringing up goes under the price action indicator, right? So it's not just this one simple price thing. It's a much bigger encompassing thing of price action, right? And that takes time and practice. I'd rather get very, very good at price action reading than RSI and MACD and all these other things, because frankly, all of them come from price, right? If you're going to be good, be good at the source. So I hope you get that point. We're just using a very quick and brief example on SUN here, but hopefully you get the gist. The next indicator now is obviously volume. Like I said, all indicators are based off price and volume. So the next thing we don't want to get good at at the source is volume. What kind of volume? There's kind of two ways I look at volume. I look for volume exhaustion and I look for relative in increase or decrease in volume relative to previous day's action, right? So the first one is volume exhaustion. It's no surprise to me that SON, if you want to keep going with this example, that this was the low. Why? Because the volume was getting bigger as it was panicking. Yes, it started off bigger out the open, but it doesn't surprise me that the low was on an increase in volume, right? It actually got fairly low and then increased again. That tells me sellers were exhausting themselves. People were panicking out. Shorts were covering. There was a huge exchange of shares from one hands to another at the lows here, which is why you see this big volume candle. You will typically see that at extreme tops and extreme bottoms for most of intraday price action, right? If we go to another example, LUNR, another classic and perfect example of volume exhaustion. Where is the bottom for the day? Of course, yes, it's at, at, it's at around eight bucks, but why? Look at the volume. The biggest volume candle on the day is at the lows. That's not a coincidence. That is the reason why it is volume exhaustion. It is people panicking out. And finally, when it got too much too soon or it got overdone to the downside, long started panicking out, stop losses are going off, shorts are probably covering, or maybe shorts are chasing because they're having fun while they miss this move. There is a big exchange of shares from winning traders to losing traders, losing traders to winning traders. And it's all happening right here, which is why it's the biggest volume candle of the day. And hence it causes the bounce and never went lower that day. Okay. It's not a coincidence and not even necessarily the biggest volume candle, but just in general, this move has the biggest volume. It's the most action. It's where the most people are watching and trading this particular ticker. You're going to see that in panics and in parabolic moves. Let's look at a parabolic move, for example, on the flip side. Now, this example of MLGO is a bit more of a choppy example, but you will see a couple tops and actually a bottom of where volume exhaustion occurred. So right out the open here, I had a lot of volume and actually halted up. This next out the open or out the halt open here actually was a short term top for about two or three minutes. Why? And why was it really choppy and wicky to both the downsides? Look at the volume, right? It actually at one point sold off all the way down to nearly $1 and then came all the way back and touched as high as there and then still held itself kind of, you know, mid range after the minute was over. It's no surprise to me that a lot of volume was there. People are trying to figure out is the top end, is the bottom end. And so you get a very large choppy candle there. Obviously nothing's a perfect science. So again, it does go higher, but then look at the top here, right? Another huge volume candle right before the next very minute. And again, it's not a perfect science, but again, it did halt it up, which makes things choppy. Why? This is why MLG was choppy. But then the next minute, it starts panicking and halting down and vice versa. Look at the bottom candle. Another one of those bigger minute candles. So again, it's not always the biggest candle in the day, like we looked at LUNR, but where the biggest candles for the day on the higher end of that range for volume typically is where most hands are exchanging, right? And the reason why we, I do this and look at this, because again, ever dreamed of trading like one of the Clovers? Well, it all starts with the right broker. Clover Trading and Centerpoint Securities have teamed up to supercharge your trading experience. By joining Unlock the Power of CP Edge exclusively with Centerpoint, we're talking top-tier trading tools worth over $6,000 all at your fingertips. Get ahead with real-time scanners, cutting-edge news, and a tailor-made trading journal. Experience trading like never before with superior short inventory, personalized support, and interest on your idle funds. Plus, you can get competitive pricing that fits your trading style. Ready to elevate your trading game? Click the Clover trading link in the description below to get exclusive deals with Centerpoint Securities.
Now let's get back to the content. This is where you see most of the emotion play out, right? You see where their shorts are getting squeezed and they're covering the top. Longs are having FOMO, so they're buying the top. Longs are panicking out and getting stopped out at the bottom. Shorts are chasing at the bottom or covering their shares because they actually are taking profits, right? There's at the bottom and top of ends of ranges where a lot of volume is coming in is the reason why. It's like almost a self-fulfilling prophecy. It's why the tops and bottoms are actually getting put in because people are so emotional and getting in or getting out depending on their situation. Okay, so that's there that for you know volume exhaustion. The other scenario for volume that I really love to look for is a relative volume, like I said. And so the perfect example of this happened literally just a few days ago on OCEA. OCEA, huge, huge runner. And on this first red day, I got very aggressive, very early short because of what I saw in the volume. So we go into the intraday here and we look at how it had a huge run up. And again, not to mention the previous example, notice the huge volume increase, not any nicely one minute either, but could be multiple minutes, how this is, you know, most some of the bigger volume on the day in a short period of time put in the top you know not a coincidence not a not a surprise there okay we go into the next day and this is the red day right it opened up with a small gap up and then sold off look at the volume look at the difference in volume look at the first few minutes out this open that causes huge run look how many how much volume per minute is coming in hundreds of thousands look at the first few minutes out of this open you can barely get a hundred thousand volume in in the first minute or two right or first per minute or two it's a big difference Right? And when I see that as a short seller or even as a long trader, I know now when volume is typically lower the next day, that is not bullish, that is bearish. And so if I'm a short seller, which I was in this day, I got short. I made like 14 grand on this red day. Had I wanted to be looking for a long bias, I would have looked how big is the volume? Is it going to be bigger than yesterday? Because if it's bigger, then I probably will be bullish. Doesn't necessarily mean I'm gonna buy it, but it certainly means in my shoes, I'm not gonna short it. We could compare it to also the two previous days. What if I thought, you know, this day was a short sell? Well, out the open, look how big the volume is. In comparison, out the open, the volume is actually pretty low and it did, and it took about 45 minutes in for the volume to actually increase here. But out the open the very next day, the very first minute had the equivalent or just as big a volume as the delayed volume coming in the previous day, which tells me there's more demand still. There is a lot of trading activity. There's probably more buyers than sellers who are willing to get in, hence why the volume is bigger. And what do you know? It had a really strong green day, you know, a small parabolic and into sevens and eights. So that's another area of, in, of volume, looking at the relative volume per day out the open, how much can actually actually come in in such a quick and short period of time because that's going to better further predict likely the rest of the day. Okay, so that's that. That's it for volume. The last indicator for me, and this is the most art like indicator of them all is VWAP. Right? That's what you see here. Obviously, it's a dead giveaway with this yellow line I've seen. And the reason why I use it is more for a guideline. Okay, I never really take entries or exits based on VWAP, but I want to know where VWAP is because it does help me with reading the price action of where we are in the trend. And it's very similar to red, green, and white. If it's above VWAP, buyers are in control. If it's below VWAP, sellers might be in control. And it's not an exact science, it's not an absolute, but you know, I am not maybe as susceptible to buying stocks under VWAP as I am to shorting stocks above VWAP. Now, it's not a perfect science. Again, in the example of Lunar, where it was a huge, huge panic, obviously that was well below view up, but anyone who bought that panic, you got a good bounce, right? If we go just even look at the daily chart, you know, on this day when I had a huge panic back down here, view app was up, you know, in the nine tens area, that was a good dip buy, right? So there is, it's not a perfect science. Some of those are great times to be buying stocks when they're under view up. Sometimes there's great times to be shorting stocks when they're over view app, but in a general consolidation period, whether it's going to the downside or the upside, I want to know how far away or how close price action is to view app. Similarly versa to finding tops and bottoms, like what we looked at about volume or exhaustion, how far away price action is from view app, which like is from the mean, like if you're like a mean reversion trader, you know, that's going to be valuable, right? And let's just go into the lunar intraday just to show that example, right? Looking at this huge panic in more detail, it's no coincidence also at the bottom when the volume exhaustion was coming in that this was the furthest that price action was away from VWAP. It got too far away too soon to where it had to come back to its mean. And what do you know? It actually went right to VWAP and tapped, tapped it perfectly. Okay. And what did it do the rest of the day? It held under VWAP. The whole rest of the day, never even touched it again after that first bounce. So again, it tells me from a trend setting, from what, what the trend was that day, it was bearish. Didn't even go over VWAP strongly at all. Vice versa, there's plenty of other strong days where stocks will maybe use VWAP as support, right? So again, it's not an exact science. Like I've said, I know I'm broken record there, but I say that because I use it as a guideline. I use it as trends. I use it as mean reversion on top of what we already talked about with price action. 
So those are the three main indicators I use. I know I try to make it sound simple, but again, there are a lot of nuances that I think you've learned from hearing me describe those indicators in this video. So again, it comes down to hundreds of hours of practice, years of dedication, like I've gotten to this at this point. But again, once I've kind of mastered these three indicators for myself, it's all I use. I've never found any interest in using RSI, moving averages, you name it, never cared. These three are work for me. Other indicators may work for you, but if you find any value in the integrators I like, you might like them too. Anyways, guys, thanks for watching the video. Make sure you like and subscribe, and I'll see you guys in the next one. Peace, everybody.